we need to do some other stuff first. Okay. Like. Welcome to Crime Crazy, the weekly true crime podcast with Aaron Pline and Diana Seacon, where we prove we know nothing about our legal system, but we're still crazy for a good true crime story. <laughs> so Diana, I want to know, did you learn anything this week? I did. And I learned something about a legal system, but it is not ours. Okay. Do we need to redo the intro? Nah. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Okay. When are we going to redo the intro? Because it has been weeks now and we have been learning shit each time. God damn it. I'm thinking, guys, we're not even going to make it through this season before we have to change one of our taglines. Mm, that is a pity. It is. Not the same kind of pity as the one that got the human fed to it. Nope. Different pity. Different, different mm -hmm. pity. That was a cute dog. <laughs> Right? <laughs> <laughs> also, that is upsetting. Mm -hmm. All right, so what'd you learn? So my, my learning is two-pronged. Um, first, I have discovered a podcast. Two pillars. Two pillars. <laughs> Sorry. Love my pillars. Um, I've discovered a new podcast. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Um, it was recommended to me actually by one of the hosts through a another podcast group that we both belong to. <laughs> nice. Not a podcast making group, by the way. Like, a podcast we are both a fan of <laughs> that we are gotcha. in that group of. Um, is it true crime? Mm -hmm. I love the true crime independent podcast community. I love, 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 love it here. Well, we're going to send some love. Thanks, Sage Murray. Um, there was a, a thread about true crime, like what other true crime podcasts yeah, you're listening yeah. to. And I put it in there like mine and our website. And this lady came and she's like, I've subscribed. And I was like, wow, thank you. And she's like, yeah, I also do a true crime podcast. You know, us, yeah. us indie true crime podcasts have to hang together. So I uh, checked out her podcast and I've been binging it for the last two weeks. Awesome. Um, so it's called Occulte Veritatis. Oh, you were telling me about yeah, this. I, yeah, because I've been binging it for the last two weeks. Yeah. Actually, she's sort of been telling anyone who would listen. So oh, we need I, to like tag this person in a post. And be yeah. Like, hey. If you are getting any new Minnesota hits. Th it like is coming All from people here. I know. <laughs> yes. Um. So they're out of Canada. They're in Saskatoon, and they, they're they not just true crime, actually. They do all manner of, of weird and interesting and conspiracy theories, and like there's, there's all sorts of really cool stuff. Um, but what I, I learned that really piqued my interest was that here in the United States, when there is somebody who is mentally ill enough that they cannot be held responsible for their crimes, yes. we refer to that as not guilty by reason of insanity. Or mental defect, I think, is the other... Not better. No, not better at all. No, <laughs> no, no, no. no, no. But, uh -uh. like, there is some very negative wording around how that is presented. Man, this would have been so applicable to my last week, right? That's actually why it... What made you think of it? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, I had something else, but I'll save that for later. Um, in Canada, they call it not criminally responsible. So oh. if you um, are, you know, having a psychotic break or if you have enough mental illness or you, you have enough, um, if there's enough going on in your head that it's not working as it yeah. should. Um, you can't mount a defense or you don't understand the law. Right. Or you don't whatever. understand what you've done. You weren't like your conscious part wasn't there with you. What, whatever happened. Right. You murdered someone while you were sleeping. Well, or um, one of the examples they gave was somebody who was kind of having a, a manic episode and actually did not remember oh. what he had done just like not there um it How is scary with abby right <sighs> um awful. but it is uh yeah not criminally responsible which i think is a much nicer and more accurate term yeah absolutely when that happens so uh first of all you guys should all go subscribe to occulte veritatis uh, and I don't know if they listen, but if they do, shout out to Ood, Sage, and Leon. I love your show. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm definitely going to have to listen because um, I just finished the Parkway Killer book mm -hmm. this morning on the bus. Ooh. So I am now in the market for something else to listen to. I mean, I did download like some just absolute trash beach read stuff that I'm <laughs> sure I will listen to, but but some more, you know, serious. and Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Very it, cool. It gets serious, but it's a lot of fun. So, Erin, did you learn anything this week? I did. I, this is sort of learning. Um, I don't know. If, I mean, it sort of stretches the definition of learning. No. Um, so, 
I finished the the Colonial Parkway book, the um, special kind of evil. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, the end just made me totally cry because the epilogue mm-hmm. is messages from families and loved ones to oh. the, all the children. So, um, did they cover your guy? Oh my god, did they ever? Okay, good because you were worried about that. Uh, but anyway, that leads to the thing that I learned. So there's this road in Yorktown, and some of the so the families of the two missing kids, Keith Call and Cassandra. Oh god, I feel so terrible. I can't think of her last name. Anyway, Cassandra, somebody. Um, they never found them, the bodies. Oh, for them, they found the car, and that's how they've connected it to the other crimes because the cars were left staged in pretty much every case. Um, there are three or four related murders. Mm-hmm. So, um, but though they they still have not found them, which is why. When we had that case where they found the body, we thought, oh, my God, maybe that's, you know, that's the right area. So the body that we covered before that Jordan and I talked about was found off Crawford Road in Yorktown. So Crawford Road is one of those places that are like urban legend kind of things. (laughs) Um, And so uh, there are two ghost stories related to it. So this is what I what I learned, because I knew that there was a ghost story about it. There's a bridge. And I think the version I heard somebody was hanged off the bridge. And like, so that was the and now they haunt the road or whatever. But there are apparently two ghost stories. I don't know what the other one is. But the thing that I didn't know that was like the the fact that kind of backs all of that up, apparently they have found numerous murder victims and bodies that have gotten their different on this road. And I know it's a big drug spot. There's a lot of drug use and sales and all of that. So I'm sure that a lot of it was overdose and violent crime related to drugs and that kind of thing. And the suicide um, was related to drugs. Um, But, but yeah, so apparently it, it's just one of those places where they have found people over and over. Wow. Which is crazy. I wonder what the pull is, whether people are, you know, going there to take their own lives or to take the life of somebody else. I mean, like overdose, if it's kind of a, you know, an area known as a place where you can get drugs or yeah. whatever, like, okay, reasonable. But, huh. Well, so it's one of the areas, there are a bunch of areas in that Yorktown, Williamsburg area and Gloucester too, that um, are just very, they're in the woods. There's no lighting. There are no street lights until you are well over the bridge in that direction. So yeah, it's a very secluded spot. It's good for that kind of activity because no one's going to, nobody's traveling there. Nobody's going to see you there. So it's probably a lot of that. Um, and I think that at least in a couple of these cases, the bodies were not necessarily, people weren't killed there. They were just dumped there. Yeah. So, and it would be a good place for that because there are miles and miles. I mean, you could put somebody there. They'd never be found. Yeah. So, obviously. Well, it's amazing, really, that we find anybody. It is. There's a lot of space to cover. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing we find anybody. Well, the last couple that they think was part of, if it was a serial killer or a pair of serial killers, the last couple that is tied to that, um, they only found them because there's so much hunting in that area. And so it wasn't until way later when hunting season started and then some hunters came across them. Otherwise, they would have never, never have found them. Well, and so the officer or trooper or park ranger whoever it was that they were interviewing for that part of the book made the comment that that year that those that that couple was found um that apparently there were he said something like it was just a never-ending train of like going back and forth to that area because hunters had found another body Uh. there which i mean it's not not like a body every day that's unrealistic no, for that but, number of people, but just... But still. Yeah. You're going out to the woods to drink, maybe hunt. I don't know what you do. But yeah. <laughs> I think it's kind of the same, right? Like ice fishing, isn't that basically just hanging out and drinking? Yeah, drinking in the cold. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, and then, you know, body. Yeah, yeah. Well, and yeah, it, it would be startling. And they had been out there and it was warm. So they were pretty decomposed at that point. They didn't necessarily find all of them. And so I think that's almost worse. I feel like if I live the rest of my life and never find a dead body, that would be okay. I'm fine. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. 
Yep. Anyway. We need to cheer this up. Right? <laughs> so that's what I learned. Uh, so. So, Erin. ready for some crime? Yeah. You got a story for me? I do. I do have a story for you. I knew you did because I saw you working on it, but I didn't look at it. Yeah. No, I, <laughs> I kept thinking about that while I was writing it up right next to you. But, yeah. <laughs> so, I wrote bunches of stories for today and Yay. kept having to go back and delete them because we'd already covered them. Oh, no. We need a better cataloging system. I'm, I'm... So, there's a story behind my story, um, which is that Sophie's birth mother, which we talk about her occasionally, um, she is in prison. We have been talking a lot about the podcast. Um, it's, of course, very interesting to her from a totally different perspective. Mm-hmm. She knows some of these people that are in our stories. One of the stories that I went to write up today, um, she was like, hey, you need to look up so-and-so. I met her the other day, blah, blah, blah. And I started to do the whole thing, and I'm reading, and I'm like, this is so familiar. This is so familiar. Why does this name sound like there's a sister? We totally covered it in season (laughs) one. And at that time, like, I didn't know anyone in Fluvana Correctional Facility. Turns out. I still think that is like... You've been in a Tivana store, right? I have not, but I, I, yeah. Okay, but you get the basic gist. Yeah. Like, Fluvana just seems like the same thing, only instead of lovely teas, it's like flu strains. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, your choices are Fluvana or Goochland, so. Both bad. Yeah. Both bad. Yeah. No, it's definitely true. I can't remember what the other ones, I'll have to think about it. I know there, there are some other women's facilities there, too. But anyway, so I couldn't do that story. But I found another one that uh, was also one of her suggestions. So this one is kind of a, it has a different feel. Like we had talked about with one of the other ones. Like it is not heartwarming, is it? No, God, no. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, No, it's horrible. Um, (laughs) But it, it feels different to me because I came at it from the perspective of, so there's this real person who committed a crime. Let's read about their crime rather than, so there's this horrific crime that this monster committed. Uh, this person's totally a monster. So our story has four people okay. in it. Uh, there are actually more than four, but we're going to talk about four. Uh, their names are Lester Wilson, Natalie Wilson, Slavka Nadanova. All righty. And Paul Wilson. One of these things is not like the. Other. Yep, Lester Wilson is the thing that ties them all together. So we'll start with him. Not literally. No. <laughs> <laughs> she thought about that for a minute. <laughs> I did. Like, uh, no, uh, no, no. He, he's not even our bad guy. Um, so Lester Wilson. This all takes place around like 2010. Okay. Ish. So, was a real estate agent. No idea if he is now. He had a bunch of marriages. So, his first marriage, I don't know much about, except that it resulted in two sons. Okay. And his now ex-wife lives in Australia. She really wanted to get away. <laughs> well, yeah. I am not only divorcing you. I am moving to Australia. <laughs> the other side of the world. Um, his second marriage was to Slavka Nadanova. They were married for nine years. They had one son named Paul, who took his dad's last name, so Paul Wilson. And even after they divorced, they were very friendly with each other. She, We're going to talk about her in a minute, but um, he would visit a lot. According to him, because that's where his his son was and he wanted to go visit the the child and then his third marriage was to natalie wilson his final marriage um i don't know maybe he's married again who knows so i feel like once you've been married three times no i feel like once you meet somebody and they're like i've been divorced two or three times no yeah well he may still be married to natalie i'm not sure but he may also be divorced and on another marriage i i don't i don't know I mean, what if this is 2010 like now. he could have had a few more by now oh totally yeah he was on a roll yeah all right so our second character is slavka nadanova Ooh, that rolled right off the tongue it did. Right? that was good <laughs> in 2010 she was 41 years old um when she was still married to lester 
so prior to that, they had moved to Europe for several years. And then he moved to Virginia after they got divorced. But he, they were still very friendly, and he would go back to visit and stay for two and three weeks at a time. Ooh. And as far as I could tell, like he definitely said there's no romance, like it's not an affair or anything like that. He was there to see his kid. But it's kind of cool that they were still that close that he could go stay and that was acceptable. Well, right. They obviously had a decent relationship, which is good for everyone. Yeah. So then eventually she moved to Virginia for a couple reasons. One, she wanted Paul to be near his dad so that they could see each other for more than a couple times a year for a couple of weeks. And also she wanted to enroll him in school here. So moved to Virginia. Here being the US, not that I'm in Virginia anymore, which is weird. (laughs) So that's her. So their son together is Paul. And in 2010, he was in second grade. He was eight years old. And then Natalie is our last, our last person. So Natalie Wilson had a daughter from, I assume a previous marriage, but from somebody else. Mm -hmm. And she came to the US from Russia there are definitely some questions around whether it was legal, whether it was a mail order bride situation, whether she was, you know, whether it was a legitimate marriage, all this kind of thing. Those questions are still largely unanswered. It doesn't totally matter, but that so yeah. largely. So in 2010, she was 50 years old. They lived in the Arlington area, so up near DC. Mm-hmm. And she speaks, to this day, very little English. Very, very little English. So one of the things between her and Lester, so they they were not married very long. It's hard to be married to somebody you can't talk to. Talk to, yeah. Well, and I think that's where a lot of that, well, is she just a male or a bride? Is this just a green card wedding or anything? Anyway, so she was very jealous of Lester's relationship with Nada Nova. I'm going to forget her name every single time and have to look at it. Yep. And believe that he was having an affair. So that's why I keep saying like that it wasn't anything romantic, blah, blah, blah. Because that was, that was what he said. He was like, no, I'm going to see my kid. Right. It's not, it's not about that. Apparently her daughter, and I don't know how old her daughter is, but there was some sort of relationship there too, like Lester and Natalie's daughter were were family too. Like they they knew each other. They I don't know if she was living with them. I don't think she was. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he knew her and considered her kind of his own. And yeah. So lots of children from lots of different people all mixed up in this this whole thing. So in 2009 in this area, there were 11 total murders that year. Ooh. In 2010, January, none. February, none until. 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 Nada Nova lived in Dale City. And at 11 p.m. on the, I think it was like the second, somewhere between the second and fourth of November, her current husband came home to find her and her son dead. Paul, who's eight, his body was covering his mom's. And so they think that he came in, saw that she was injured or dead at that point and tried to help her. And that's when he was murdered. Tragic and horrible. Nada Nova was stabbed between 40 and 50 times. Oh, God. Yes. That is anger. Yes. So the police, of course, began their investigation. It was, they said it was, it was very much a situation where the community was on edge. Like, this is a low crime area. Like, 11 in a year is not that many. And that it is very unusual to have an adult and a child murdered right. unless it's like a family annihilator situation where there's like a, a suicide with it or an attempted suicide with it. I and like that's a metal band somewhere. Family, family annihilator. annihilator. God, that would be a terrible name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, and it's going to be a bad band too, but you, <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh. Um, so there was a lot of like the community was very, very on edge with this crime and they wanted it solved quickly. And so the police dove right in. It was hard because 
nobody spoke the same language. So Nada Nova, as you might guess from her name, was Bulgarian. I would not have guessed that actually, but... Well, I was going to say was not from the States, <laughs> which is also true, but she was, she was Bulgarian. And then, of course, Natalie is Russian. Mm-hmm. And so the police had to rely on FBI translators who came in and helped them conduct their investigation because nobody could talk to anybody else. Oh, my. Lester, at the outset of the crime, as soon as he found out his ex-wife and son were dead, he was very public about, I want whoever this person is caught. I want the death penalty. Like, the highest penalty should be paid for this horrible thing that happened. Well, of course, the very first and only suspect was Natalie. The moment... (laughs) Oh, oh, yeah, no, not him. him. (laughs) No, sorry, yeah. (laughs) No, he probably would have been a good suspect. But he actually never never was a suspect. I think because their relationship, it was pretty well known that it was a very good... She moved to another country twice to be with him. So... Um, and he was a supportive father and all of that. So Natalie was the, the suspect. So the moment he learned that she was the suspect, his tone totally changed. I want this to be over. Like, I don't care what happens. We shouldn't seek the death penalty. Um, her, her poor daughter, like, I, I really feel for her. I don't want her to have to go through this. Let's just, you know, whatever. So a lot of double standard going on there, but maybe kudos for being a loyal husband. I'm not really sure. So whoever did this should be put to death. Unless it's my current wife, then, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a little torn Uh, on that. I don't know about that. They arrested Natalie the day after the murder. So the the problem... (laughs) with all of this. So they arrested her very quickly. Everyone was really happy that they made an arrest really quickly, but the town's mind at ease a little bit. And I say town like it's not tons of people, but you know, the <laughs> area. And they they decided not to pursue the death penalty. So they during their investigation, they called her in. They had to have a translator. They did a whole interrogation. It was actually a 22-hour interrogation. Oh, so wow. Really long. I don't know what an average length of interrogation is, but I can't imagine doing anything for 22 hours, let alone, like, trying to not say I killed someone that I killed. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh. In that high-stress situation, it would just be exhausting. Um. So they decided not to go to the death penalty or for the death penalty for three reasons. One, very hard to get the death penalty for a woman, especially yep. in Virginia. Not going to do it. So that raises all sorts of issues. Like people, if the jury knows you're going for a death penalty, then they might not want to even convict because they don't want that to be a possibility. Um, two, the husband didn't want his wife to receive the death penalty and normally that wouldn't matter because he's not the victim but because of that relationship and it was his son like that had a little bit of weight with the prosecution just that you know (sighs) i don't know i'd almost want like i i'm not in favor of the death penalty at all but like if somebody i knew killed my son i'd make an exception yeah i don't care if i'm married to that person (laughs) i might make an exception yeah no i i agree but i also see why like the prosecution would have been like well okay yeah. you know maybe maybe we can go for something less sure third was the interrogation which was problematic so the confession is taped all 22 hours of the interrogation mm-hmm. with the interpreter are taped there they said there were problems and the defense brought up some concerns about the translation and a lot of things being lost in that and that that she maybe didn't understand what she was saying or she wasn't clear about it or maybe they didn't understand what she was saying and just concerns in that general area, which is probably right. always fair. Yep. Uh, second is they cited coercive interrogation tactics and they weren't more specific <sighs> about that, but apparently it was enough of a concern and it was all taped and everything that that was something that was a motion that was brought forward and given some serious consideration. Ultimately the judge said, no, like I've watched it. It's, it's fine. Like she did it. She's still not denying that she did it. She's, you know, willing to plead guilty, everything else. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. She said in the interrogation and in her guilty plea, cause she eventually does plead guilty that it was self defense. And even the defense was like, what the fuck? I even wrote that in my notes. WTF? (laughs) How 40 to 50 times you had to stab this woman to defend yourself at her home? 
how how could that have happened? I feel like after the first 10, 20, yeah. you're pretty well incapacitated. So Criminal Minds, which is an obsession of mine. <laughs> Wait, what? I've I, never heard you talk about this. I know, right? It's huh. not like I have made my new unofficial job title communications liaison or anything. <laughs> uh, but one of the points they make in a couple of episodes is about the physical energy involved in stabbing anything more than a few times. Well, it's just not muscles that most of us use regularly yeah. that, you know, up and down and like, yeah. I and can't and imagine. through. I think about like, and I know you have adrenaline going at the time. Right, but still. But surely that wears off after 20. I'd be like the after the first one, I'd be like, "Oh shit, yeah, what did I just do?" Everywhere, yeah. Well, I'm, and this is so pathetic, and it's gonna really tell on myself. But whatever, like stirring cookie batter or whipping egg whites for a meringue, like right. Oh my god, that hurt. Yeah, I was putting together IKEA furniture, and I was like, "This screwing motion is really hurting my arm." I could never stab someone forty to fifty times. Good to know. Yeah, yeah, you have nothing <laughs> to fear. I cap out at two. Okay. So if you can survive those. I bet um, I could. There's a lot to get through here. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on where I stab you, Diana. Oh, you know some things, too. I just cut you right here, right here. No. Just... Really feel like this shouldn't be on tape. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's, that's how you know I won't ever do it. That's Because now I've said it. Now there's recorded. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so in Virginia... <laughs> If you kill someone and you are convicted, your two choices are life sentence or death. I feel Um, like they're not your two choices. The only two options (laughs) that may be applied to you are. No, they're, well, they're definitely not. Because like with the selfie killer, you can't choose. Right. (laughs) If I could get the death penalty, that would be great. That would be great. So they convicted her. Well, actually, she pled guilty, so there wasn't even any need to convict her. Two life sentences that she is currently serving in Fluvanna Correctional Facility. Uh-huh. Yep. And was it really just jealousy over the relationship? Yeah. That, oh, man. I mean, she said self-defense, but it, that makes no sense. Right. Um, and it was widely known she had accused him of cheating on her, and I don't know that I totally blame her for that concern. He had been married a number of times to at least two women from like Eastern European kind of that area, you know, he had a type. He, well, yeah. And, and her marriage may not have had any love at all. Like it may have been her livelihood that was threatened. It may have been, you know, her ability to, to stay. Maybe he, she was just miserable. Yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that if, the man you're married to goes for weeks at a time to another country to stay with his ex-wife with whom he is very friendly and has a child that that would threaten your relationship. Yeah, I could see that, but I also may not have married him. No. Well, but if it's a situation where she married him because she wanted a different life and saw that as the avenue to a different life, then there's got to be more than one guy that you can target. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I I don't know either. I'm so glad that that is not my reality. Yeah. But I I definitely understand where the jealousy and fear and concern could have come from. I do not understand how that translates to 40 to 50 stab wounds and murdering a small child. No. Uh -uh. I cannot imagine. That part to me, if she'd killed the ex-wife, like it would not have been a crime that caught my attention. Yeah. It's the kid. But, yeah. And for what purpose? Yeah. She confessed the next day. Like, well, yeah. She, it wasn't like she was trying to get away with it. No. I mean, maybe originally she was, but ultimately she didn't try. Yeah, like that didn't last very long. No. And so why? So he wouldn't identify her because he was a threat to her? Because she was jealous of him too? I don't know. Yeah. But now she is in prison for the rest of forever. Will never, ever get out. No chance of parole, anything like that. Virginia doesn't actually parole anymore. And she doesn't get to see her daughter. She doesn't get to see her husband. There's a quote in one of the articles that I was reading from her. And it was like, I had everything. And I was so happy. And I loved you. And now here I am. 
in jail like what am i doing here what what was i thinking kind of thing and yeah, yeah no you totally destroyed you, so many lives you biffed it yeah so, so yeah plus she is now in a prison and i'm sure she is well immersed and learning lots of english very quickly but at least when she arrived there she didn't speak the same language as anybody anyone telling her what to do anyone she was living with anyone that she needed to befriend or beware of none of that she was totally 100 percent isolated wow. and they do not provide translators in prison to make you up like that's just no. none of that no and they're no. not nice i like it's a maximum security prison they shouldn't be nice but i happen to know they're like almost unreasonably not like almost cartoonishly yeah not nice at this facility and yeah they don't give a fuck that you can't understand them not at all or that you have any you know anything yeah. else going on yeah. So, so yeah, that's what happens. But wow, so not terribly uplifting. No, not heartwarming at all. Not, not in the least. No, all right. I try to avoid heartwarming. Good deal. Yeah, I prefer it that way. Yeah, definitely not heartwarming. I, I'm kind of interested, and in it's not the kind of thing that I feel like you can research and find out. Um, I may try to get some inside information. I don't know if there's any potential for that, but the husband. Is he still married to her? Does he still love her? Has he moved on? Is he married again? What ha is he in the area? Like, I'm, I'm really interested what happened to yeah. him after that. The good news is at least he has a relatively common name. Yeah, yeah. He's not going to no. be, be well known. I don't know that it would really matter. I don't think this was a case that got a ton of publicity. Well, right, but that's the thing. Like, you know, even if he moved, like, here... Yeah. People wouldn't figure it out. No. I'm not sure that people... I mean, I guess probably where he is, if he stayed right exactly where he is, people would know. Yeah. And I don't know what his relationship is with her daughter or how old her daughter is or who's taking care of the daughter. Mm -hmm. um, well, if she was 50-ish, her daughter may well have been a grown-up. Yeah. She and Lester had been married less than a year. I don't know that I actually wrote that down, but that was the other, the other thing about it. Like, it wasn't wasn't any kind of long-term thing. Yeah. So that's what I've got. What do you got? All right. Heartwarming? No. Just checking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a nice bit at the end, but until then. Okay. All right. So I went I went vintage this week. No. I went vintage and I went Canadian. <laughs> nice. Uh so I actually found this um uh I follow Atlas Obscura uh -huh. online and they one of the articles I was reading not too long ago talked about uh, this roadhouse museum in uh, British Columbia somewhere. And then it said something about the architect. And I was like, I'd like to know more about that. And so and now I do. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, Francis Mawson Rattenberry. 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 Oh my God, that's my next character name if I write another book. <laughs> Rattenberry. Uh, he was a British architect and businessman who spent most of his career designing buildings in and around British Columbia, Canada. Ooh. He was born in 1867 in Leeds, England. Your case is only a tiny bit older than mine. It or at least the start of it. Bit. Yeah. And began his architectural career at the age of 18 by beginning an apprenticeship with his uncle's architectural partnership, Mawson and Mawson. Mawson and Mawson. He found really uh, a lot of success early in his career. He won the Soane Medallion in 1890, which is a coveted prize awarded to the winner of a national competition held by the Royal Institute of British Architects. Wow. So it was a pretty big deal. Rattenberry was called Rats by his friends. Had uh, always As been. As you would have to do. Yes. Uh, he'd always been fascinated by Canada. And there was a recession going on in England, and he thought, what the heck, let's do this. Mm -hmm. Move to Vancouver. While he was in Vancouver, he won the international competition for the new provincial parliament building to be built in Victoria, British Columbia. He was up against 67 rivals, and he won wow. the commission to design the provincial parliament in Victoria. He was about 25. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Go, dude. Yeah, yeah. He was very early success, uh, very successful early on. He designed lots of other 
important buildings in Canada, including uh, Roadhouse, which is the one I was listening or reading about, uh-huh. uh, Nanaimo Courthouse, a bunch of Bank of Montreal buildings, the Pacific Railway Steamship Terminal in Victoria, and a whole bunch more. Ooh, I bet that's beautiful. I bet it is. Um, a lot of his buildings have been demolished because they're old. The Parliament right. building is beautiful. Um, this roadhouse, actually, they've made into a museum, mm-hmm. um, and it's fully restored to Victorian times and furnished. Ooh. It looks like it's really amazing. And they said it was one of the one of the few houses in Victoria like that. Uh-huh. He was not only an architect, but he was involved in a whole bunch of business ventures that I am not going to get into. But one of his most notable was supplying meat and cattle to prospectors during the Klondike Gold Rush. Ooh, yeah, what a weird departure from architecture. <laughs> well, so it wasn't entirely. Um, he uh, did some of these commissions, and he went to work for a couple of the railways and did designs for them. And he went uh, between a couple of the different railways. Uh-huh. So I think that's how he got into it because he ended up buying like some box cars to transport the meat up to the Klondike and. It, it all yeah, did kind of tie together. I guess so. It's but it was one of those like I can see how you got there, except you didn't kill anyone in the end. Well, right, but it was like long and a lot of business things. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. He seemed to have kind of a cycle uh, with these business ventures. They'd be successful for a while. They weren't successful anymore, and then he'd have to fall back on his architecture career huh, to pay the bills. Thing. I know. Well, right. At least you had a good backup skill, right? A seriously good backup. Yeah. skill. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm a little broke. I guess I'll design a parliament. Right. <laughs> you know? Maybe I'll win some international prizes and yeah. then I can go back to selling meat. Right. He's, <laughs> he's like 40, like he made like $40,000 in the late 1800s on meat. Wow. Right? He like just, I would do that today if I could win 40, if I could get $40,000 yeah, out no of it. Kidding. That's worth having. Yeah. In 19, nope. I, I also would like to own a box car, just as a side note. I would like to have forty thousand dollars worth of meat at my disposal. What would you do with forty thousand dollars worth of meat? I'd eat it. Forty thousand dollars worth of meat. I like meat. It better be some really, really, really good meat. Yeah. Oh, well, Otherwise, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to eat like ground chuck or some shit. I want well, some no, good but stuff. Like, even if it's really, really, really good meat, that's still a quantity of meat. I'd need a bigger freezer. Yeah, a whole box car, <laughs> several box cars. So maybe we could team up. You could buy a box car. <laughs> I'll put the meat in there. <laughs> All right. In 1898, Rats married his first wife, Florence Eleanor Nunn. She was called Flory. Oh, Flory and Rats. Entirely possible. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know why that was funny. But that's how their friends knew him too. I uh, possible they got married because she was knocked out. <gasps> right? Not sure. You know, it was the late 1800s. Yeah. They had a son, Frank, and a daughter, Mary, together. Frank and Mary. Yep. And Frank Mary was apparently Rats. Francis. I don't know if it was officially junior, but Francis something something. Right. Right. Rats worked on quite a number of buildings, both buildings that were constructed and buildings that never were and he continued to engage in business. He got involved in civic affairs locally. After World War I, the slow economic recovery really hurt his architectural practice. Mm-hmm. But there was another factor uh, that also contributed to the decline of the practice, and that was the scandal of his extramarital affair with Alma Victoria Packenham. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who these uh, names are insane. Right. It's because they sound like words. But not quite. But not quite. <laughs> and also not words that really belong together in a name. Right. So Alma had been married twice before. Mm-hmm. She had been widowed in her youth. Her first husband uh, had died in World War I. Um, and after that, she sounds like kind of a badass. Um, after that, she like went to Europe. Well, she, yeah, she went to France and became an ambulance driver, I believe it was, and won a couple of medals. So yeah, she was a pretty badass gal. Came back, got married again, and was almost divorced by the time she took up with our buddy rats. Uh. Um, Also, she was known to smoke and drink in public. (gasps) 
No. Mm. Extramarital affairs. Smoking. Bastard children. Drinking. No, the ba- the kid wasn't a bastard. Well, no. Well, he would have been. No. No, the because he married his first wife or whatever, and she may have been already knocked up. The first wife was knocked up when they got married. They were married for like 25 years before he met her. Before he no, met I'm Alma. saying just like all of the things in your story that are scandalous. Oh, yeah. Not for the one woman, yeah. But I, I don't know that anybody necessarily put together that their oldest kid was you know, a shotgun. L- a little too old. L- yeah. Slightly. So not only was Alma known to smoke and drink in public, she was also 28 years his junior. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, Flory was not interested in getting a divorce, and he was a dick about it. Oh. He moved out of the house that they shared and had the heat and the lights disconnected. (gasps) Bastard. And when she wouldn't move out still, he said, fine. And he moved Alma back into the house. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, They apparently lived upstairs or... She lived upstairs and they lived downstairs or something, but like all three of them lived there for a while. Uh. Right? I really liked him at the beginning of this story. I'm really bummed with you rats. Yeah. Bit of a dick. Right? All that success went to his head. I don't know. I don't know at that point how much success there was. I mean, he was in his late 50s. Like, he kind of burned early. Well, right, but maybe he just thought he was hot shit because... Oh, he definitely did. He was very involved in the civic affairs. You know, he was periodically very well off. Right. You know, so yeah, no, he he had some opinions about himself, I'm sure. Once the affair was made public knowledge, he was no longer welcome in Victoria. And he was avoided on the streets. Good. He was estranged from everyone, including his two grown children. Mm. I mean, he was horrible to their mother. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's a particular kind of horrible too. Like, yep. yeah, it was it's real a shitty. step beyond. Yeah, so Flory finally agreed to the divorce. He and Alma were married in 1925, and in 1928 they had a son, John. Okay. In 1929, Flory passed away, and as a result, he was just totally shunned in Victoria. Uh, everybody thought that his cruel treatment had had something to do with her death. I mean, she, again, was also in her late 50s. Sure. Um, but that that was just kind of the end with him, the city of Victoria. They were done with him. I, I'm a little proud of the city of Victoria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't fuck with Victoria. Right. So the, the two of them, well, I suppose the three of them now, there's the son, along with Alma's son, Christopher, from her second marriage, moved to Bournemouth, England. The move to England didn't uh, really solve their financial problems, though. Although Alma was actually a successful radio singer and songwriter. All these people with all these talents. She was a a kind of a badass. Yeah. And yet a homewrecker. A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Yep. Um, Rats only engaged in minor architectural work. Uh, As a result of their financial situation, he experienced bouts of depression. He drank heavily. In addition, uh, he and Alma never had sex again after John was born. <gasps> he was not able to. Oh. So that was a situation that would get him depressed. He would drink really heavily. Sure. Apparently, he talked about killing himself like every day. Okay. So he moved to England in 1929. By 1934, there were five people in residence at their house, which was called the Via Madeira. Ooh. I want a house with a name. You could have a house name. Name your house. It's not the same. No, probably not. Uh, so he lived there. Alma was there. Christopher was 13 at the time. Alma's son from the, her second marriage. John was six. And then Alma had a live-in companion slash housekeeper named Irene Riggs. Okay. I want one of those. Oh, man. I need a wife is what I need. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Since rats had a bit of a problem with the bottle... It was decided that they should hire a driver slash handyman. Wow. So they put an ad in the local paper and a local 18 year old named George Stoner (laughs) applied for and was given that job. I wouldn't let anybody named Stoner drive me. No. (laughs) He was a, a Bournemouth local who had largely lived a sheltered life with few friends. He was described in various sources as handsome, simple-minded, 
sexually naive, and a good, honest boy. Aww. I fear for his safety. <laughs> Within two months, he was Alma's lover. Ah. And, she, and had been installed in the spare room of the Via Madeira. Alma thought that she was in love with him. And in turn, he was in love with her. Oh, yeah. He would become jealous, though, when Alma paid attention to Rattenberry. And he her be- husband. Her husband. <laughs> who, it, this one is in his late 60s. Yeah. Has a problem with a bottle. Hasn't been laid in years. Yeah. Kind of a mess. And he apparently became very upset when, uh, because of this jealousy, she was like, maybe this needs to end. Right. You're kind of being childish, dude. <laughs> I mean, he was 18. Right. Around midnight on March 23rd of 1935, Rattenberry was discovered in his chair in his sitting room with severe head injuries. Ooh. He'd been hit in the head multiple times with a carpenter's mallet. Ooh. With enough force and savagery to remove the back of his skull. Oh, my God. The doctor was called. Why? It's because he late. was still alive. <gasps> no. Yeah. Okay. That, that sounded really overly dramatic, but that caught me off guard. Yeah. No, he was still alive. Oh my God. I, now I feel bad for him. Yeah. Uh, so the doctor was called when he arrived. Alma said that uh, Rattenberry must have fallen and hit his head on the piano. But by the time the police arrived, she changed her story and told them that Rattenberry must have tried to kill himself with this wooden mallet. And has, then, has anyone ever bludgeoned themselves to death? I never have considered that as a potential suicide avenue. Well, in the back of the head, like... Well, that, that's unrealistic, but I mean, like, at all. You would have to be successful on the first go. Because if yeah. you hit yourself hard enough to do any kind of damage, it's like trying to strangle yourself with your bare hands. It's not going to work. Well, right. But even like, I mean, if you hit yourself hard enough to pass out but not die, yeah. like you don't get the second. Yeah, no, that's yeah. like a real, real bad move. So second story was that he must have tried to kill himself with a wooden mallet. Because remember, he did talk about killing himself constantly. Sure. And then she changed her story again. First saying that she had hit him in the head with the mallet. Mm. And then that stone. Okay, well, I thought Stoner did do it, so now I'm confused. Wait for it. Rattenberry was taken away, and Alma, who at that point had had a few, mm. tried to bribe an attending police officer, and then she tried to kiss him. Well, I mean, it's kind of worked for her so far. Sure. Francis Rattenberry died of his injuries three to five days later. Oh, my God. So... I read a lot of articles about this. It's actually pretty extensively covered. There was some pretty good uh, contemporary coverage of it. There's been uh, a TV movie, miniseries, something like that. It's been based on all this. So there's actually some good documentation. Well, yeah, because it's very dramatic. Like it would, there are a lot of. Oh, and it gets. I'm feeling a little roller coaster ish at the moment. Oh, actually, it gets, it gets better. Oh, all right. Um, but the sources I read were all over the place about how much longer after he died, it was as short as three days or as long as five days. So not 100% sure where and that that was. What what year is it? 1935. I wonder if there's some like differing definitions of death or like some ambiguity with coma versus death or yeah, i don't know nobody really mentioned it everybody just had a different day span but i weird i suppose i could have looked to see if anybody had an actual date but that's just, too much work i just honestly it was getting real late <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because of the notoriety of what had gone on he was buried in an unmarked grave in bournemouth the murder trial of Alma and Stoner was one of those trials of the century. Yeah. They were tried together at Old Bailey on May 27th of 1935. Uh, the word of the crime had spread so far that they weren't able to be tried locally. They had to go to oh, Old yeah. Bailey. During the trial, Stoner refused to say anything. He would answer to his own name. That was it. Wow. Yep. That's probably a wise move. Not a bad move. 
Alma put up a really robust defense. Four days later, Stoner was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging, while Alma was found not guilty and released. However, public sympathy was really with Stoner. People thought that he had been manipulated and led astray by this older woman. I don't think that's untrue. Like, that seems pretty likely. It may be. Um, And she was actually booed as she left Old Bailey when she was released. Wow. Yeah. On June 4th, 1935, Alma took the train from Waterloo to Christchurch and walked to the Three Arches Railway Bridge. She wrote some notes. She walked to the water and then stabbed herself in the heart several times. Several times? Several times. Times. How do you do that? I don't know. I couldn't give myself shots. I just couldn't do it. Yeah, several <laughs> times. Which is why when you're like, does anybody allege on the of death? I was like, wait for it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, several times. She died almost in- instantly. After more than one time. Yes. From the notes she left and from the songs she wrote during the trial, it seemed that she really did love Stoner. She wrote a a really lovely little song. When he was informed of her death, he broke down and cried. (laughs) Alma was buried in an unmarked grave in Bournemouth, a few yards away from her slain husband. Oh, my God. After Alma's suicide, a petition was raised to request mercy for the poor boy who had been led astray by this this older woman. Right. 320,000 signatures were collected shit. <laughs> and delivered to the home secretary. The home wow. secretary did commute Stoner's sentence to life imprisonment. Okay. And he was described as a model prisoner. After serving seven years of his sentence, he was released early to join the army and fight in World War II. He did serve in World War II. He was involved in the Normandy invasion. Wow. After the war, he married. They had a daughter together. He lived in Bournemouth for the rest of his life. He largely flew under the radar, except for that one time in 1990 when he was given two years probation for assaulting a 12-year-old boy in a washroom. However, it is... (laughs) It is possible that he was already suffering from the Alzheimer's disease that killed him 10 years later at the age of 83. He died on the 65th anniversary of Francis Rattenberry's murder. Ooh. No wonder there's a lot of like, like contemporary coverage of this. Yeah. It was a big deal. He actually did some interviews uh, in the, I think late eighties, maybe early nineties. Did he ultimately admit to having killed the husband? To kill rats? Yeah. So it, it was definitely, it wasn't like he they, got blamed for her crime they, or anything like that. They both went back and forth, but it seems like he probably did. He's probably right. the one that did it. But he, either way, it was it was a decision they made. Like it, it kind of sounds like it probably was, or maybe it was jealousy driven, but like she wasn't doing anything to tamp that down. But like his family lived in the area. It sounded like he kind of went, before he lived with them, went back and forth between his parents and his grandparents' house. And before this all happened, he'd gone to his grandparents' house. He'd borrowed the mallet. He'd brought it oh, back. Okay. So there's so, no doubt that he was involved. He was involved. Gotcha. Whether Alma was involved was really manner for speculation because the general opinion was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like she, she did it and she killed herself because she felt remorse. But the other story is she killed herself because this guy that she really loved was just sentenced to death by hanging. Yeah. Um, well, I think it could be both. Yeah. Why not? And either way, her husband, however she felt about him, was murdered. Like, she'd been involved in a lot of shit. She lied for the boyfriend at the very, very least. Yep. Like, she definitely was the cause of the murder whether or not she knew about it ahead of time or participated like yeah and it doesn't sound like she hated him no like she was still spending time with him they had a six-year-old like they had these two kids it sounded like they were mostly just like distant and he was drunk yeah like he was depressed and unhappy and drunk and 
you know, not that any of it's excusable, but it didn't sound like, you know, she was going around town like the one person, like, I'll give you $57,000 to kill my husband. Right, you know, right. If it came up, if he did it himself and she knew better to try to cover it up, she may have also been drunk by the time the doctor and the police got there, which is why the story changed. She was definitely drunk by yeah. the last part of it. Yeah. So it's still, it's really actually up in the air about what really happened. Who sure. actually swung the mallet? Whose idea was it? Who knew what? Um, I mean, I think it's fair to say that she is still guilty for it, even if yeah. she didn't. Even if she didn't know until after it happened that it would have even happened. Like it was still, still kind of her fault. It wasn't. You can't be responsible for somebody else's right. horrific actions. But but it doesn't sound like she took any steps to make him feel better or well she created the situation that ultimately yeah. caused it yeah and knowingly created that situation but again probably learned because she'd been moved into oh yeah <laughs> you know? no she really that's how you do that and it was and by that person right i mean rats was the one that moved her in. yeah right yeah 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 just you know the karmic circle here so the only person in this story that's still alive is john rattenberry Oh. And I and I only actually believe he is alive. I tried to do a little bit of research on him, and I've I've got some some details that are actually pretty cool, but I couldn't tell if he had passed. Gotcha. Um, but he'd be like in his early eighties by now. Mm -hmm. He grew up to be an architect like his dad. Oh my gosh! He studied with Frank Lloyd Wright at Taliesin. Oh my gosh! And after Wright dro Wright died. He was one of the founding members of and the head of Taliesin Architects. Wow. He's, he's written several books. He's, he's very well regarded as an architect. Well, uh, kudos to him for picking like the one trait from his father that he could emulate. <laughs> well, and there was a, an article that I read a little bit of where they, they interviewed him where he saw some of the buildings like his dad. Because oh. he's... Um, well, Talius is here, I think. but he went to Victoria and was shown some of the buildings. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, it was one of Retz's buildings that he and Alma met at. So he, oh, you know, saw the, yeah. that hotel and all that. So, so it was really neat. So he followed his father's footsteps, and and found quite, just the good ones. <laughs> yeah, but found quite a lot of success. That's cool. Interesting. Yeah. In 2007, John Motherwell, a Canadian engineer and amateur historian based in Victoria was writing a book about Francis Rattenberry. And he went to visit his grain in Bournemouth, but of course couldn't find it because it's unmarked. Right. The people at the cemetery knew where it was. They were able to show him, but that bothered him, that his grave was still unmarked. So he purchased a gravestone. He had it engraved with his most famous building, the Parliament Building in Victoria, huh. along with the pseudonym that Rats used when submitting his design to the competition, British Columbia architect. Huh. What a cool, that was such a cool story. Yeah, it really was. It's, you know, again, I, the, the article I read from Atlas Obscura about Roadhouse, um, you know, I looked at it because it's a Victorian house and I love those. Yeah. And then it was, you know, oh, it's one of the surviving relics of, the, you know, this part of Vic Victorian history in Victoria. Right. And, you know, it was designed by this famous architect, but that was all overshadowed when he was murdered. And I was like, whoa, what? Oh, <laughs> hold on a second there. I would like to know more about this, please. Right. And then, yeah, I kept digging and there was such good contemporary coverage. And, yeah. and you know, really the, you know, Stoner ended up, turned out okay and you know yeah and had a pretty good life and surprisingly everyone who lived turned out okay like the sun yeah. is good like things yeah i think i think everybody out. did turn out okay but that picture i showed you earlier that's yeah. the bridge that alma stabbed herself by oh that is not her as far as i know i was just looking at pictures of the bridge <laughs> you know? sure but it had that eerie kind of feel well, it, to it too that was yeah cool. not too far off time wise i figure i don't i don't see a date on it but i figure late yeah. 1800s yeah just by the way she's dressed oh. but yeah it was it was such a beautiful picture and i could almost picture her right there but you know it said she walked down the river by this bridge like i could picture her there like writing her notes and makes me think of ophelia yeah pamela yeah yep very much so huh i liked that story a lot that was a good one yeah 
it was surprising at every turn. <laughs> it really was. And there was so much more. I mean, it talked about his oh, business bet. ventures and the different architectural stuff. And like, there is just, I mean, there are books written about this man. And I really want to read, um, his son, John, wrote a book about the founding of the Taliesin Architects, which I didn't particularly reason, realize was a thing. I've learned about a little bit about Taliesin from like 99% Invisible and stuff, but I don't know a ton about it. Right. Um, that might be an interesting read. Yeah. But other than that, it seems like he's flown pr- pretty far under the radar. Like he doesn't have a Wikipedia page. He's got some listings with like the books he wrote, but there's not a lot of biographical information. I he's, mean, he has a, a very unique name that I feel like he's probably had to work pretty hard to fly under the radar. Well, and I didn't find anything that tied him other than that one article where he talked about visiting the buildings his dad had done Yeah, that necessarily tied him. Like when you read the brief biography about the book, it's not John Rattenberry is the son of the dude that designed the parliament not in Victoria. It's, John Rattenberry is an architect who studied with Frank Lloyd Wright and when he passed, founded Talius and Architects. And right, right. You know, I couldn't even find like, is he married? Does he have kids? Is he still? Huh. I couldn't even find out if he's still living. Right. <laughs> you know, he he's tried to yeah. be a little bit more quiet for somebody who's really had a, a very good career. Right. Well, and a very intense life. Yeah. Yeah. Especially young life. That's Very much so. And I mean, he, was, he was six. Mm-hmm. You know, how much does he remember? Oh, no, I'm sure. But I feel like there would have been a lot after he was six. Like there would have been a lot of that drama still going. Yeah. And I wasn't, and years. wasn't really able to find anything what happened because it was both of his parents are gone. Yeah. You know, his yeah. Mom where died did he right go? Away. Yeah. And she wasn't from around there. Yeah. So, yeah, I wasn't, wasn't able to find a ton about him, which I thought like, good for you, dude. Yeah, I bet that was I bet that was challenging though. I'm sure when when a whole town turns against your father because of an affair, like yeah, <laughs> probably pretty challenging to yeah, yeah, and, and that's like the least of what happened in his life. 1920s, you know, Victoria was not a big town, right? 1920s, you know, British Columbia. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, I like that. That was a good story to end on. It was way happier than mine, even though everyone died. <laughs> I, well, it got a little heartwarming at the end. <laughs> it did. It did. It, it redeemed itself a little bit there. Awesome. All right. So any shout outs this week? I don't believe we have any. We do not. Um, but I will tell you that Crime Crazy is sponsored by M. Gillum and Elizabeth Wilder. Woohoo! Two thank, of my favorite ladies. Thank you. Show sponsors support Crime Crazy through Patreon at the $10 per month level or above. Thank you, ladies. A special thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. If you'd like to support Crime Crazy, please check out our Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash crimecrazypod or search for Crime Crazy Podcast. All patrons get a monthly shout out on the show. Woo! Yay! If you'd like to receive an, a shout out, please rate and review us on iTunes or your podcast catcher of choice. If it is not iTunes, you may want to just give us a heads up because we may or may not catch it. Yes, we are <laughs> still trying to figure out how to catch all of them. Right. Like Pokemon. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. Anywho, if you'd like to receive shout out. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's where we were. <laughs> please rate and review us on iTunes or your podcast catcher of choice. We can't catch them all. So if we miss it, please oh God, feel free no, to send it. Start over. We give shout outs for all reviews, but we like those five star ones a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Second place would be like four stars. I'm good with that. Yeah. 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 But you know what? You give us one star, still getting a shout out. True. So you can find us on. You can follow Crime Crazy on Facebook at facebook.com slash crime crazy pod from there catch up on the conversation by joining the crime crazy group you can follow us on twitter at crime crazy pod on instagram at crime crazy pod you can visit our website at crime crazy podcast.com or email us at crime crazy podcast at gmail.com you should email us it would be fun it's true especially if you have like a story or you just want to still talk about toes or if you have ideas like Oh my gosh. Actually, we have we have some in our inbox that I have done a terrible job with this move and everything else. We have some great case ideas in there that we need to pull. Ooh, and I have a good one from, I think I told you a little bit about from my, my friend Dave that I'm going to 
do pretty soon. Ooh. Yeah, it's something that he remembers from when he was a kid. Yes. Yeah, you did tell yeah. me that. I'm really excited. All right, you can follow us on Twitter. You're at... Erin Pline. I'm at Diana underscore Seacon. And on Instagram, you're at... E Pline. And I'm at Classy underscore Broad underscore MSP. Are you proud of me for getting that right for the first time in weeks? I am. <laughs> I even pointed it to you. I know. I saw you flip the notebook around and I'm like, nope, I'm not looking, I'm not looking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, Diana... Yeah. This is like my favorite part. <laughs> Someday I'm going to biff it and we're both going to be so disappointed. I mean, one one week you told everybody just not to get caught. So oh, I'm going to so keep good. bringing that up. Uh, so <laughs> do you have any sage advice, words of wisdom for us this week? I love being married. I have a really great husband. That's not wisdom. I mean, that's great, but. Marriage is great. Is what I'm saying. Okay. You don't have to marry everyone. That is definitely a theme this week. It really is. Like, you can just date or or live together or... Not if your wife also lives in the attic. Unless she's cool with it. Well, okay. If she's cool with it, go for it. But it does not sound like she was cool with it. it. No, she was definitely not cool with it. But, you know, just see where things go. I know that Beyonce says to put a ring on it, but like Beyonce's been married to the same dude for a long time. Also, you can totally have a ring without having to get married. I know that's not what that means, but like you could right. still put, you could still give her a ring. That's a, a nice, nice gesture. Com- <laughs> a nice commitment ring, like our lovely work friend. Yes. See. Yes. The I'm not going to get married, but I love you very much, right. and I bought you a pretty thing. I'd like to hang out with you, kind of a lot. A lot. Yeah. Also, sparkly things are nice. Definitely. So don't, you don't have to marry everyone. Call your people. Call your people. Although we did okay with that this week. No one, no one's body got left for lots of time. That's true. We did, kn- we did know where everybody was. <laughs> we did. At all, sometimes too much. Even so, pick somebody you haven't heard from a while. Just check in on them. Just see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And don't end up on next week's episode. 